Hey Cedar Rock, this is Pastor Nathaniel. In our recent Sunday message we studied uh, the story of Noah's Ark and the flood. And uh, we talked about um, what that really meant, uh, what it means for us. We also spent a little bit of time talking about the objections that we often have to the story of Noah's uh, Ark and the flood in general. Uh, we talked about, the, we asked the question of ourselves, is this really believable? Could this actually happen? And we spent a little bit of time doing that. I alluded to the fact that I didn't have the time to really flush out that question completely during our Sunday service. So I thought I would take a little bit of time now and try to answer perhaps some of the questions and objections you may have to the flood. Maybe uh, just up front and saying I am no scholar when it comes to these things. Uh, I don't have all the answers, and you may find still these comments unsatisfactory, but I hope it at least uh, begin the conversation so you can know where to go to look for answers. Uh, the first way to think about uh, the flood in general and some of the question and objections that we have is the question of was it a global flood or was it a local flood? And what I mean by that is uh, some scholars... Uh, will try to deal with the many objections that people have about the flood and the complications they think that, that arise when we consider that. They'll deal with that by saying that the flood may not have been around the world, that it was just the world that Noah knew. And so the flood was not a global flood over the entire planet. The flood was just over uh, a local region where Noah lived. And that's how they try to deal with some of the, the problems that arise when we think about the flood. Um, and so there's some solid folks who, who adhere to this thinking. Uh, personally, I have a hard time squaring that with what the text says. The text seems to indicate that this was a, a global, worldwide flood, just in the language it uses. Uh, but I do want you to know that that, that that perspective is out there. Personally, I don't hold to that perspective. I don't think that the Bible allows us to, uh, to, to go that far. Uh, I think the text of Scripture uh, makes it so that I think it's pretty clear God wants us to think of a global flood uh, in, this, in this section here. The other thing to think about, so that's, that's the first thing. The second question that often arises uh, deals with the water. Uh, the kinds of water, how much water. Uh, there are some just very simple problems of how is it that if, if a flood is over the entire earth, then we have the salt water and fresh water mixing, which is, which is harmful for the uh, underwater life, uh, perhaps devastatingly so. How did that work? Um, and we don't know. I mean, the, we have no answers to that, other than the fact that uh, perhaps there was some sort of divine miracle and, and God preserving the animal life, the fish life, in, in, in those ways. Uh, um, so there's that. There's also the question of how could there be enough water? Uh, one of the, 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 we read in Genesis uh, 7 on Sunday how the water covered the tallest mountains. And the tallest mountains today are really, really tall. And for the water to cover those mountains, it would take more water than is currently uh, on the planet to, to be able to do that. So how, how did that work? Um, the, the most satisfying answer I've seen to this uh, is that the, um, it's not that uh, there was more water on the earth back then, it's that the geography was different. And so um, the tallest mountains were not quite as tall as they are today. And in some sense that makes sense. If there is a giant deluge, a flood, that covers the entire planet, you think about how devastating a small flood is to the terrain of a certain area. I mean, it kind of devastates the land. A flood that covers the entire earth would have monumental effects on the, on the land itself, on the topography, on the geology, on the geography, um, on the tectonic plates themselves. I mean, you can imagine that if, if this much water pressure is, is pushing on the land, that that may have forced some of the tectonic plates to move in such a way that these mountains have emerged. That's just uh, one, one guess. So the way that the waters covered all the mountains is not that there was that much more water, but that the mountains were that much shorter back then. That's, that's one way to deal with that particular objection. Um, and as far as the animals, 
you know, we wonder how in the world could Noah fit all of the animals in the world on the ark? And uh, the answer is he didn't fit all of the animals in the world. Um, for one, uh, fish life, marine life was excluded from this. So things that could survive in water were not included in the list of things that, that weren't, went on the ark. Um, in addition, uh, you know, when you think about all the animals, we often think about, you know, when it comes to dogs, that there are uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of different kinds of dogs. Well, in that example, Noah probably didn't take all of the kinds of dogs, he took uh, two different dogs, two dogs. Uh, and that from those came uh, the rest of the dogs that we have today. That's just one example. In other words, he didn't have to take every single subspecies of every kind of animal uh, because within a given species there is room for interbreeding and, and for the, the variation that we see among uh, dogs or cats or turtles or whatever. There's di different kinds of turtles, different kinds of birds. And, um, and so it would not have been that he would have needed to take all of those. And so in this commentary, James Montgomery Boyce addresses some of these questions. He runs the numbers, he quotes from a book that I referenced, Tim LaHaye and John Morris's book, The Ark on Ararat. And uh, he, let me just read a little section here. Um, uh, and so he, he says, um, total animals that we know, 1,072,300. He says, this is a large number, of course, but not all these species had to be on the ark. Obviously the fish did not, nor did the tunicates, the echinoderms, mollusks, etc., etc., etc. Simple subtraction brings the previously large number down to approximately 35,000 or 70,000 individual animals, one male, one female. Moreover, although we usually think of large animals when we think of the ark, like elephants, hippopotamuses, giraffes, most land animals are in fact quite small. The average size is less than that of a sheep. Since 240 sheep fit comfortably in an average size two-deck railroad car, and since the volume of the ark would have been equal to 569 such cars, calculations show that the animals to be saved would have fit into approximately 50% of the ark's carrying capacity, leaving room for people, food, water, and whatever other provisions may have been necessary. As LaHaye and Morris note, such simple calculations are certainly not beyond the abilities of the scoffers. What does seem to be beyond them is the willingness to try to see if the biblical story is feasible. All that to say, Boyce is saying, LaHaye and Morris are saying that, that there's room. There was room for uh, the, the animals that needed to be on the ark. Uh, and so that's the case. You may still find some of these, these thoughts unsatisfying to your questions. To me, as I alluded to uh, in the sermon, the most persuasive uh, observation that helps me make sense of, of the flood is what I told you about the fact that all of these remote cultures, from the smallest little tribe in Papua New Guinea to the, the, the folks in South America to the Native American tribes, so many cultures have a narrative of a flood. And this narrative of a flood uh, is, is so common and there's common features of this story, it's as if they're, they were all passed down the same story and then over time these different cultures forgot details or changed details to fit with their, with their pagan religions. To me the fact that all of these cultures remember something about a giant flood, uh, a flood of judgment, indicates to me that, they, that there's something going on there and that there was indeed a giant Flood. Scriptures, uh, of course, tell us what that is. And it tells us what happened in that flood. And it tells us this not just for our own morbid curiosity, but it tells us this so we can see, A, sin brings judgment, but also, B, uh, that there is hope for those who walk with God. And that's what we saw uh, in our message and how all of that points to Jesus. So those are just a couple of thoughts to help you uh, wrap your minds around this. There, is, there are other resources you can go and read far more in depth than what I've just said. People who've studied this for years and years, I encourage you to do so. Otherwise, uh, I hope this has been encouraging, and uh, thank you for watching.